So we finished up last week talking about uh, the mobile context and how it both adds extra design constraints or complications to your design scenarios, but also in that it allows you to leverage those uh, the mobile context to create applications that go above and beyond what you could do uh, with just a desktop application. So we'll summarize very briefly some of the advantages of mobile devices. So we've looked at their popularity already, how there's, there's more mobile devices and more internet accessible mobile devices in the world than there are desktop computers. Uh, so popular, they're personal and personalizable. So you're much more likely to be the only user of your phone than you are to be the only user of a PC, for example. They're portable, obviously. So they're constantly connected, always on and always with you. Uh, they're at the point of creative impulse. So if you have an idea or you see something that you want to capture, you can capture it straight away. You don't have to wait until you get home and write it down there. Uh, they have built-in payment channels. So that's something that hasn't been leveraged a lot yet, but something that's probably going to uh, appear more and more in the, in the near future, probably in the next couple of years. And it captures the social context of media consumption and production and can interact with their environment. So to expand on that last point, interaction with the environment, uh, we have things like a mobile uh, device knows uh, the time, it knows your schedule, uh, it has telephony obviously and messaging, but it also uh, has sensors uh, that can uh, recognize the amount of ambient light, uh, a compass to know the direction that you're pointing, uh, a camera to capture visual data, a uh, microphone to capture audio, uh, in some cases even a thermometer, and in a lot of cases geolocation and possibly altitude as well. So all these things together make a mobile device or many mobile devices very aware of their surroundings. Now just a note about when we talk about mobile, uh, what we really need to think of mobile is, is more of a usage scenario than a form factor. Because mobile doesn't just refer to something that's the size of your mobile phone that fits in your hand. Um, obviously there's been an explosion of tablet sized devices and so forth and so forth. So, so we have to think of mobile not as a, a specific set of hardware specifications but as a way of actually using the device. So obviously mobile users are mobile and what goes along with that is that they expect their applications to adapt to their surroundings and their surroundings which are much more unpredictable because they're much more variable than on a desktop context. So let's look at some uh, of the mobile device design constraints that we're going to have to consider. So one of the most obvious ones is presentation issues. So things like the screen size, resolution and colour reproduction. Although you'd probably be hard pressed to find a uh, phone with a, with a monochrome screen anymore. Um, so these are just some uh, infographics uh, showing the, the variability between, theirs, uh, between these, uh, these factors. And these, you can see they only go up to, that graph on the right only goes up to 2008. So these are horribly out of date at this point, but um, if you go to a link like this and search things like this, you can find good reports about how prevalent various different um, screen sizes and, and um, pixel densities and all that sort of stuff are. Um, but that's, that's merely there just to demonstrate how much more that varies uh, when you compare to the desktop context. So you've also got um, constraints to do with input. So on devices that actually have physical keypads, um, they're, uh, they're a limited keypad. They obviously can't fit a full-size keypad pad on a mobile device. Um, so they have small keys. Sometimes they don't have full QWERTY keyboards. Uh, as far as a pointing device goes, uh, while, while things seem to have progressed to fairly universal, universal um, direction towards touch-based interfaces, you still, depending on what devices you're targeting, may have to deal with things like D-pads and rollerballs and, and little joysticks and, and various other kind of pointing devices. And this particularly affects how you navigate uh, around the interfaces on the phone. 
Uh, other constraints include uh, bandwidth and cost. So um, obviously to transfer, either upload or download, the same amount of data on a mobile phone plan is going to be more expensive than on desktop plans. So that's something we have to keep in mind. And then there's speed and latency issues uh, as well. Uh, and that's especially for lengthy content or content that requires a lot of navigation between pages. Uh, so we'll talk a little more about that, um, the speed stuff later. Uh, we have hardware limitations, so things like processing power, memory, battery life, all of that uh, can play a factor in how do we design our applications. Uh, the usage environment is unpredictable and changing, so for example lighting conditions, um, your user might be using it in bright sunlight or, uh, or uh, in the dead of night. Um, so again, that's something that's much more variable than in the PC context. And the user has different goals. So generally they're more immediate and goal-directed intentions than desktop web users. And uh, in terms of the software, we have limited ad, ad hoc or no standards compliance. So because it's such a new field, when, whenever there's a new field of anything, generally it takes a little while before people agree on what's the best way of doing things. So all of these things are getting better and better um, each year as we go. Things like processing power on mobile devices is, is gone up in leaps and bounds. And also, fortunately for us as designers and developers, things like standards have improved a lot lately as well. Now, if we look at the devices themselves, you might, you might hear the term device fragmentation. Okay? And this, this extends from what we were just talking specifically about screen size before but uh, take that to the entire device. If you think of the entire gamut of features that, that different mobile devices that are currently in use might have, then that is a lot broader, again, than in the desktop context. So depending on who you're targeting for your application, you may be targeting people with phones that they may still have that they bought you know, before 2005, before touch phones even existed. So if, if you have to target that, that wider gamut of devices, then um, you have some extreme differences in all, all of these uh, all of these constraints that we've just been talking about. Um, so we have things like proprietary browsers. Um, so a, a manufacturer, rather than using, rather than having the same browser work across multiple phones, they'll create a browser specifically for that phone. And it's, things like that are not necessarily that they do that. Um, to make things more difficult, but sometimes if a, a device is underpowered, then the only way to create a, a functional piece of software that will work on it is to create a, a, a specific proprietary application for that device. So again, this is something that we're moving away from as the engineering and the hardware itself becomes more adva advanced. Um, so there, there are some services that actually allow you to uh, that sort of aggregate all this data about the, the different gamut of mobile devices. So there's there's some um, like uh, there's a database called Device Atlas, and there's another thing called WURFL, which essentially just aggregates data on all of the different uh, handheld devices that it can get. And so you can go through and you can see sort of. Um, you can see graphs that show you how popular certain things are, like different screen resolutions, and then it will it'll give you various pages and links to all of the different hardware capabilities of a phone. So these can be useful in the initial design phases of your application to allow you to narrow down what, what um, scale of, of capabilities that the phones that your target audience is going to have. Uh, because there's nothing worse than developing something and then realizing that most of the people who you want to use your application can't do it because they don't have the hardware that supports it. Okay, so this is a table of some of the different implementation options for mobile applications, uh, sort of ordered from the least complex to the most complex. So you might be interested to see that the top one is, is SMS. So in a lot of places where people, it's very common to still have phones that we would consider old that no one uses any for, anymore, a lot of people actually this is their only method of being connected. Uh, so you'll find, um, especially in a lot of um, sort of more developing countries, that uh, 
that they have applications for things like um, communicating um, natural disasters and so forth. And the way that they do that, purely because it has the most reach, is through SMS. So it's still viable that your application, the way that it communicates, may just be very simple communication of SMS messages. So then you move down from that and you have what this table calls mobile websites and mobile widgets. Um, and they differ from mobile web applications below that in, in just in the sense of how um, probably how uh, how different the, the browser platform that it might run on is to a, to a fully featured um, what we might consider a, a modern mobile web browser. So we did talk a little bit last week about when there was all these different ideas for how the how websites might be rendered on mobile phones. So with things like WAP and WML and all these various other uh, uh, web, web communication standards on older mobile phones. So again, if you're targeting users that have old phones, they, they may be something that you need to consider. For the purposes of what we're going to be developing or you're going to be developing for your, um, for your second assignment, the two that we would probably that you would probably um, decide on tossing up between would be the a mobile web application and a native application. And so essentially mobile web application is using a browser on a modern phone that has capabilities that are pretty close to that allow you to do things that are pretty close to everything that you could do with a native application. And then the native application of course is the one that doesn't run in the web browser, it runs as a as a, a, a application that's native to whatever platform it happens to be running on. Um, okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the difference between those two that I've highlighted there, if, if you're trying to make the decision between which of those to go with. So I've just got a few links here that I won't, I won't look at now, but you can look at later on, uh, which discuss some of the pros and cons of uh, choosing the native application development path over the web application development path. And I've summarized some of the points here, um, the pros and cons of both. So with the native application, uh, the most obvious pro is that it offers the best user experience, uh, leveraging all of the device's features. And it also has a built-in revenue model. So you, there's a built-in way for you to sell your application through app stores. Uh, it's a lot harder to monetize a website. Um, some of the cons, uh, they cannot be easily ported to other mobile platforms. So, I, so if you're looking at, if you're looking at the big three, so iOS, Android, and uh, Windows, Windows platform, all three of those have different programming languages and different fr frameworks that you'll need to learn in order to recreate the same functionality across all three major platforms. So that obviously is going to um, add to the cost of your development process and the time that it um, takes as well. Uh, the applications require certification and distribution from a third party that you have no control over. Um, so so um, particularly in the case of the, the, uh, the Apple App Store, um, if you don't adhere to any of their rules, then they have every right to refuse to sell your app. So you might put all of this time into developing it all this money into it and then you try and sell it and because they don't like what it does that you can't sell it through their app store and because that's the only way you can legitimately sell apps for that particular device then uh, you've kind of cut yourself out of that entire revenue model. So as you'll hear us repeat again and again looking into these things before you actually start developing is going to save you a lot of pain down the track. Um, and the last the last con uh, is that it, it, it requires you to share revenue with, with one or more third parties. So for every app that you still want to sell in the Apple App Store, they take a cut of 30% uh, just for the privilege of allowing, uh, of well, for the service of them distributing your application. So you might say that's fair enough and people argue about what's a fair cut, but the point is that if you sell your app for a dollar, then you only get to keep 70 cents out of every app that gets sold. Okay, so now let's look at some of the pros and cons of mobile web applications. The pros are that they're easy to create using basic HTML, CSS, and JavaScript knowledge, and which makes them simple to, to deploy across multiple handsets. 
Okay, so there's no there's no proprietary code if you, that you need to target at different handsets if you're just creating a web application. Uh, the content is accessible on any mobile web browser, and you could extend that to say that if it works on a, on a mobile web browser, then anyone can also view your application in a in a desktop web browser. Now the cons are that it can be challenging, although not impossible to support across multiple devices, and this is just due to the the fragmentation of the different browsers and rendering engines that they have. But again, this is something that's, that's become much less of a con and you could almost eliminate that from, from that, that side of the list, um, I would say, at this point. Um, and they don't always support native application features. So there are, and usually due to security reasons, there are um, usually a, a certain subset of features like things like accessing the camera and offline storage and file system access, these kind of things that uh, the web application, um, a pure web application can't necessarily uh, access. Uh, it, is, it is interesting, it might be interesting to point out that when the iPhone was first released there was never any intention for an app store and Apple was really pushing that any third party developers would release their applications as web, app, web applications. And so it's obviously kind of swung the other way due to popular demand um, and competition. Everyone's now kind of going the, the, uh, the native application route, but uh, as the sort of HTML and browser technology progresses more and more, we're seeing that swing back the other way again. So we actually do have this thing that, that you could almost say is the best of both worlds, which is our multiple phone web-based application framework. And essentially what this is, is it allows you to code up a web application using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And once you've done that, it will sort of wrap that in a native application um, for a particular platform. So what this means is that you can have the one code base, but you can still actually package this as a native application across any number of phone platforms. And this is something probably just in the last year that I've noticed a lot of, a lot of, um, sort of large companies have, have gone this route, um, especially things like, uh, like banks for their applications. Uh, I've noticed that my bank, bank application when they brought it out, and it's probably because they're a little bit behind, first of all, and they had to bring it out quickly and support multiple devices, that they've actually, I can kind of tell by the way that's designed that they've gone this route. Um, so this is something that's quite interesting and, and um, actually allows you in some cases to access some more of the features of the phone that uh, just having it run in the web browser won't allow you to do as well. So there's a link there to a bunch of options for various uh, different types of these um, application framework wrappers uh, which you can look at and that's something that we may uh, towards the uh, end of the semester look at as well if you're interested in packaging your web application as a as a mobile app. So needless to say because this subject is obviously advanced web design we're not going to get you to create a, a native application kind of decided for you that you'll be creating a web application. But it is possible that, that you could then wrap that up as a native application. And if you wanted, you could, you could sell that through an app store as well. Uh, this is just a link to uh, W3C Mobile's web best practices. Um, so from now on, we're kind of talking specifically about uh, web application development. So web best practices is something that's, that's been around uh, for desktop browsers a lot, but as you'll note, this is version one of the mobile, but it does take into effect, uh, this, this is a nice sort of uh, centralized repository of what the general consensus is from the people who are responsible for web standards as to the things you need to consider when you're developing mobile websites. So let's look a little bit at mobile browser capabilities. So this table breaks uh, browsers up into various different classes of uh, browser. So class A being the most fully capable down to uh, class F which uh, has very limited capability. Uh, and you could, you could almost match these up with diff different generations of, of cell phone technology. Um, so I'll only briefly mention the lower ones again because um, for the purposes of your assignment, we expect that you'll be targeting a modern capable phone just because it allows you to do the most. But you can see as you go down, you see less robust support for things like CSS and, and no JavaScript. And then all the way down to the bottom, 
you get things like they don't even render uh, images and things like that. Okay, but for the purposes of our for the purposes of our um, for your assignment, we'll probably be focusing on on these class A browsers, and and I'll just mention the rest as as something to keep in mind because in some scenarios you will have to target multiple multiple classes of browsers, and we'll talk a little bit about how, how you can do that as well. So these are the main mobile browser engines. If we're talking about those sort of top tier capability browsers, so. Uh, and these these uh, are across desktop and and uh, mobile browsers as well. So we have uh, WebKit, which is uh, the browser engine used for Safari, Chrome, and their mobile equivalents. BlackBerry, Palm, and Kindle. So interestingly, WebKit had a had a very big head start in the in the mobile realm. Um, even even when Internet Explorer was still by far the dominant browser on on uh, the desktop context. Um, and that was pretty much because the WebKit was the, the browser that um, Apple went with when they released the iPhone and they obviously got a, a head start on everyone else in that department. Uh, we've got the Presto rendering engine which is used on the Opera browser as well as their mobile browser. The Gecko engine used on Firefox and their mobile browser. And then the Trident engine which is used on both the desktop and mobile versions of Internet Explorer. So probably the one that you're going to want to use as your reference uh, reference engine for development is going to be the WebKit engine. Um, just because um, A, it's probably the most diverse. So particularly if you, if you look at the two most popular platforms, uh, um, iOS and Android, okay, both of their browsers are going to use the WebKit engine. So if you so if you just get something working in the WebKit engine, then it's going to support the great majority of devices. Again, you have to temper that by the fact that we're assuming that you know, your, your target audience of people uh, have this class of device. So WebKit, the same rendering engine is used in Safari and Chrome on the desktop, so it's capable of rendering the real web. So this, with, with the iPhone, that browser, and a little bit with Opera Mobile, they, these were the first um, ones where I guess the devices were powerful enough where everyone said, okay, well, let's, let's forget about trying to create a separate web standard for mobile devices now, and let's just have render the one. Um, let's, let's have the same rendering engines on the desktop as we have in the mobile context. So the very nice thing about WebKit is that it's standards compliant. Um, and it's used in mobile browsers by Apple, Android, and until recently Nokia. I imagine Nokia, because they've gone with Windows now, is going to use the Windows uh, Internet Explorer for their browsers, but that's something that we'll still have to wait and see. Um, but the point is that WebKit by far accounts for the greatest chunk of uh, mobile devices. And it's also, I guess, the one that, that's influencing other, other browsers to, to catch up. Okay, so let's start talking a little bit about HTML5 and uh, especially how we can use it in the mobile context. So HTML5 and the current client of intense development around optimizing both desktop and mobile web browsers for web applications are quickly closing the gap between web and native application capabilities. Uh, so I've got a few links there just to, um, these are just some sites which aggregate some of the, the cool things that you can do with HTML, some of the things that you wouldn't necessarily associate with just a plain website, it's stuff that's more like a, gives you an idea of what kind of native, native application-ish kind of things that you might be able to achieve with HTML5. Uh, and on the right here I just list some of the new functionality allowed by HTML5, including native support for audio and video without a plugin. Uh, the canvas element for drawing and animation, uh, document editing, offline storage, drag and drop, and geolocation. So geolocation is one of the big ones and one's, one of the ones that's very um, useful in the mobile context and it's one that we'd hope that you would include in some capacity in your, uh, in your mobile application that you design. So we'll go through this in a lot more detail in the tutorials, but I've just got some, some links there that talk about the geolocation APIs and how you implement them. But it's essentially through 
uh, you access the you access the geolocation uh, abilities of the device through JavaScript calls. Uh, we've also got CSS3 to fit along with that, and that's what we'll be looking at in the tutorials this week. And it allows for creating far more complex designs using a minimum of images. Um, so you can do things like gradients, rounded corners, uh, all this sort of thing, which you would normally have created images in Photoshop and then use them in the, in the web page. Uh, we can do that now just by defining them as a set of numbers. So that's a lot more efficient in terms of data storage, so you can see how that uh, benefits the mobile context. Uh, so you see we've listed, we've got things like gradients, transitions, animations, and custom typography. And again, I've got a link there to a similar, similar site which shows you some of the capabilities of that. And in terms of JavaScript, um, JavaScript is kind of the other, the other tier of, of the application of, of what makes web applications separates uh, an interactive, rich uh, web application from a fairly static website. So we can start looking at how JavaScript can enhance our ability to create uh, native looking and feeling uh, interfaces for mobile. So it allows us to do things like dynamic HTML and Ajax calls which allowed us, allow us to fetch data and, and refresh part of the page without refreshing the entire page. And event handling so we can actually handle things like multi-touch events using JavaScript on the, on the phone itself. And then uh, that bottom link is just a link to uh, jQuery, jQuery, which is a um, very popular JavaScript framework, uh, their mobile version of that. So again, we'll be looking into this stuff in more detail in tutorials. Uh, you can create full screen web apps so that they take up the entire screen and don't look like that they're running in the browser just by using various um, meta tags and different devices respond to different meta tags and those are just some examples of them there. Again, we'll look at that in more detail in the tutorials. So some of the trends towards uh, the future is essentially closing that gap between um, being able to distinguish the difference between a, a web application and a native application. So we're starting to think, look at things like uh, persistence, meaning that uh, the application can still uh, execute while uh, it's closed. So that's something that native applications can do that to this date web applications don't really do. Once you close the browser they don't sort of keep chugging along. Uh, allowing push notifications like native applications do. Uh, and then access to more APIs for accessing the different features of the phone as well. So I've got a link to a couple of uh, 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 presentations on, on the evolution of this stuff which might be interesting to look at. And this is just a couple of graphs showing you that very quickly the, the, the gap between what looks like a native application and what looks like a, a, a web application on the mobile device uh, is closing uh, very quickly as more features are added. So I really do think that you'll see a, a trend um, trend towards more web application development on mobiles now just because the the the, the cons are being reduced um, whereas the pros are being increased uh, very quickly. So either way, it, either whichever route that you choose to go, native application or web application, the important thing to remember is that a whole lot of your design uh, process is going to be the same. You're still designing for um, particular contexts and particular hardware and particular screens and particular users. Okay, so a, a whole lot of that, uh, a whole lot of that design process is going to be the same either way that you choose. Okay, so you can still rely on your, you know, your favorite interaction design, user experience, software development models. Okay, so let's uh, look at a little bit more detail um, about um, how we can deal with designing for the extra device fragmentation in the mobile um, field. So we'll look at designing for multiple screen sizes and orientations first. Uh, again, I've got a couple of links to different articles here. And you'll find, um, if you search around, you'll find a lot of nice uh, summaries of, of all of the different or the common different screen sizes and then ways that you can uh, adjust your content to fit those. An important thing to note is that the average screen size is increasing. Okay, so you've got 
anything from sort of your iPhone, your three and a half inch, now four inch iPhone displays considered physically on the lower lower scale of, of the size now up to what's still considered a phone is something like the, the Samsung Galaxy Note. And then of course, that's only really a small step then to some of your small seven inch and then 12 inch tablets. Um, but an important trend is that the screen size is increasing um, from as, as we get newer generations of mobile devices. But what's increasing actually quicker is the pixel density itself. Um, so, uh, so things like the, the Retina display, which Apple brought in with their iPhones and their iPads, and then a lot of the Android devices are having uh, bumps up so that you end up having, in a lot of cases, higher resolutions on smaller screens in the mobile context than you do uh, on, on, on uh, laptops or in the desktop context. So it's interesting to note now that actually the highest resolution you can display you can buy on any platform now is the the, Mac, uh, the Retina MacBook Pro version is, is actually a higher pixel count than any consumer level desktop monitor that you could actually buy. So this is something that's important to think about because um, you can't rely on the fact that a pixel, a lot more on the desktop context, you can rely on the fact that a certain number of pixels are going to be roughly a certain physical size. But in the mobile context, you can't necessarily do that because you might have things ranging from 72 DPI like it is on the desktop all the way up to 300 and something DPI on the, on the retina displays. Uh, okay, so some of the things you do when designing for multiple screen sizes and orientations. Decide early on which screen sizes you will design for. Write semantic code that communicates without the addition of complex visuals. Where possible, use flexible layouts that automatically adapt and scale to screen widths. Okay, so this is something where actually uh, HTML and CSS are really good as a layout engine on the mobile context if you're dealing with um, varying screen dimensions. And so we'll look at the whole area of responsive web design uh, with things like CSS media queries where you can have uh, CSS that's specifically attributed to different physical dimensions of screens. So down here is a, is a screenshot from um, the very good and thorough article that you may have seen about the redesign of the whole BBC platform. Uh, web platform, both desktop and mobile. And one of the things that they said that they did is, is they had to define rules for the content adaptation across the screens. So in the middle there, they had a reference design, which they thought was their most common or their, their base design. And then they developed rules for how to modify that design if you went up to a bigger screen or down to a smaller screen. Uh, viewport meta tags are something that become important. Uh, again, these are just meta tags that go in the head section. And they tell essentially the mobile browser how far it should zoom in or out on the content. And again, these vary from browser to browser, but we'll talk about that more. Uh, but this is a better way of visualizing it. So without defining the viewport uh, on a web page, you can see on the right that it looks way too zoomed out. And the device will just choose an arbitrary width value. In the case of the iPhone, it's something, I think it's something like 800 pixels. So it, it maps its whatever its width is to, to 800 pixels unless you specifically define it. And so on the, on the left, uh, if you define how, how many pixels you want it to be wide, then you get a much more readable uh, version of the content without having to zoom in. Uh, so let's talk about information architecture, specifically navigation. So navigation is something that's quite often overlooked but is really important and especially important in the mobile context um, because users will quickly get frustrated with poor navigation um, just because navigating on a small mobile device is going to be more difficult than on a desktop device. Um, so this is affected by both the display and the input and compounded by things like the network latency. So again, for the purposes of, of your assignment, you can just deal with the touch realm, but uh, it is good to keep in mind that navigation is different in different classes of mobile devices. Um, so as you can see on the left, this is, this is a, a Motorola Razr V3. 
um, which was very popular in the early 2000s, and you still do see them around and in use. And so obviously it's going to, navigation is going to be a lot slower on this kind of device than it is on something like an iPhone with a touch input. Um, but all I really want to say for this, about this is that you know, you have to look at how people actually are able to input information um, and design your navigation probably quite differently depending on what the two of those are. So let's just talk about designing touch-friendly web pages. Um, so you can break this down really specifically in terms of, of physical attributes. So fingertips are typically around 10 millimeters in size. So with that in mind, you should space elements far enough ap apart to avoid overlaps between touch targets. So you'll notice on a well-designed mobile interface, there's usually things, things that there's sort of this there's sort of this fight between you you want to you want to space things really close together because that fits more information in a small display, mm -hmm. which might be okay for passively viewed information, but anywhere where there is um, anywhere that requires input, then you'll notice that things start to, to look um, really fast spaced apart to the point where if that was an interface on a, on a desktop browser where you use something very precise like a mouse, then you would think it was too far away and required too much moving of, of the mouse. Okay, but it makes sense in a mobile context where you're, you're pointing at stuff with fingers. And the point below that uh, makes the point that um, you, there may still be some devices that use a stylus, which is a more specific pointing device than a finger. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that a stylus can easily be used on an interface designed for touch with fingers, but not necessarily the other way around. Um, so you should also take advantage of uh, the multi-touch gestures where appropriate, and also using sensors, local storage, and contextual form inputs, things like this, to reduce the required manual input. So um, a, very obvious, a very obvious case of this is if you've got something like, um, let's, let's think of the Google Maps application, and you're trying to get directions to go from somewhere to somewhere, if you can automatically input a location based on the GPS data and save someone from having to type in an address, then that's going to be a lot more user-friendly than, than requiring them to type in the full address. Uh, so we'll look probably more in, in tutorials about this, uh, but this is something that's fairly new to HTML5, is contextual form inputs. So you can actually apply in uh, some of the attributes of, of these HTML5, uh, HTML5 tags what type of data is being expected to be input into a, a particular text field. And that can inform the, the browser as to what type of input display it will actually, uh, actually bring up to allow people to enter data. So for example, on the left there, you can see uh, there's a these are all text input forms, but if I tell the browser through an attribute that I'm expecting a telephone, okay, then it will bring up a telephone dial pad rather than the full keyboard where it's actually more complicated to enter, enter in plain numbers. Similarly, uh, on the right there, for something like an email, if you tell it that it's an email, then it can bring up, it, it knows that you're probably going to use a character like the at symbol and so it brings that up as part of one of its, um, uh, one of its uh, default display buttons. So this is something where, it, where, a, where a soft keyboard, an on-screen keyboard is actually really useful because uh, rather than a hard uh, physical keyboard where you can't change it, a soft keyboard it can be changed um, very easily to the context of, of the user input. So this is just a table of, of uh, some of the different uh, form inputs that uh, can be given contextual, uh, contextually different input uh, displays. Uh, so you can see things like calendars and time and stuff like that. So if it was a date, then you would click it, and it's up to the it's up to the browser or the platform to decide what it it um, displays for a particular context. But most of the time, you'll find that a date will bring up something like a calendar or, or one of those scrolly things that allows you to select months, days, and, and years. Uh, so these are what some, ah, so there's also mobile contextual links, and so this is an example of some of those. So you may or may not have uh, ever used these, but you can, if you 
if you put uh, things like TEL colon at the start of a, of a href attribute in a link in your web page, then a lot of phones will interpret that as you, if, if, that you're clicking on that, that you actually want to call that number, and they'll launch the phone application and dial that number. Okay, so again, that's something that's saving the user time. They don't have to go copy and paste it or just remember it, open up the phone application themselves and enter it manually. Okay, so let's talk about um, navigation, desktops versus the mobile. So this is what you might consider a, a typical layout for a desktop with your content area, uh, header, footer and sidebar. Generally when you're laying out content though in a mobile context, it's going to be sort of a single column view. Uh, it's designed obviously for vertical scrolling and the most contextual information is at the top and the content consumes the majority of the screen and quite often you have exit points at the bottom. Um, because the content is thin, it can be quite long and so it can be frustrating once you get to the bottom of an article to scroll all the way back up the top to access the navigation. So it's quite common to uh, repeat the navigation at the bottom. Uh, okay. The most common methods of creating mobile, mobile navigation schemes is to use simple vertical list of options, uh, often assigning uh, corresponding numbers to the access keys to the keypad. This probably applies more to the older class of phones like this. Um, but the second point is still fairly valid in that showing multiple levels on navigation within your, um, within your navigation list usually doesn't work well in the mobile context because it gives users too many options and consumes valuable screen area. So a better way is to show only the options related to the page that they're viewing. Uh, this is a good side-by-side -side comparison of a, the same website in the desktop and the mobile context. So this is the New York Times website. So the important thing here is putting the most contextually relevant information above the fold. So above the fold refers to whatever is visible on the web page without scrolling down and obviously that area is going to be a lot smaller on the mobile device than on the desktop device. So you can see that they've decided their most contextually relevant information on the mobile device is going to be the most recent news updates. So that's what they've put as the very first thing that you see in the mobile version of their site. Uh, there's other things like using top line labels for forms, again, due to the fact that the, the width is going to be a lot less. If you use left, left aligned ones, you size them down, you end up not being able to see the name of the label that you're entering something in when you click on it because it often zooms in. So aligning them to the top, just very simple things like that allows them still to be visible while you input the data. And don't reinvent the wheel. Um, so Often, but not always, common design problem patterns have common solutions, so you should take advantage of the research and expertise of others. So these are just some links to some, uh, some popular uh, mobile design solutions. Uh, so it is a good idea with everything to have a look at what other people have done. If there's a similar problem and they've come up with a good solution, then there are probably things that you can, you can gain from, from analysing that. Um, but I will just say with that, always keep a critical mind when you're looking at that. Don't just take a pattern and use it. Go, I'll just take that because it worked. You've got to think about what things worked and why they worked and why they will work for your context. Okay, designing for different mobile browser capabilities. So this is just a repeat of that table with the different, um, the different uh, classes of browser. So I will talk um, briefly about uh, some ways that you can uh, that you can make delivering content to different de um, device classes uh, a little bit or how you can manage that process I guess. So you've got something called um, progressive enhancement or graceful degradation. So progressive enhancement is where you have your baseline application as the various simplest form, the thing that will work on everything and then you have versions of that which you progressively make better for, uh, for better, uh, better classes of device. And then graceful degradation is the other way around. You target the most, uh, the most capable device and then you have a set of rules of what you strip out for uh, least capable devices um, below that. So it's the same thing, just 
one starting from the bottom and one starting from the top. Um, and I should probably just mention on that, some of the frameworks that we're going to look at have that kind of stuff built in, which is really nice because you can create something, uh, you, you usually target the, um, the best, best experience and it will handle, it knows what, what, um, what, what capabilities um, to take out as you degrade the experience and it will do that automatically for you so you don't have to worry about that so much. So an example of that might be um, a framework which, which has built-in um, transitions between, between interfaces, so things like fades and swipes and things, and they're usually done with uh, JavaScript. But it realizes that not all devices are going to support JavaScript, so uh, if the, it has fail safes in. So if the JavaScript doesn't load, then it will still transition between those pages, not with an animation, but at least you can still navigate between them. So that's, that's an example of what we talk about um, with graceful degradation, starting with the best scenario and then taking things out as they're not supported while still keeping the application functional. So another important thing is to keep the content logic and presentation separate, okay, which is an extension on, on uh, the, the principle of, you know, that you've already know about the separation of presentation and uh, content, presentation and structure with HTML and CSS. So you're aware that that makes maintaining things a lot easier because you can change one without the other. And so we separate that out even further and say, okay, we'll keep the, the, the content itself, the, the logic of the application, and then the presentation of the application separate as well. And WordPress is a good example of, of something like this. So we have the model, which generally refers to the database, the data itself. We have the controller, which is the logic of how to combine that data. And then we have the views, which is in our case, or in your case for the first assignment, was the template that you created. So you could create different views and read that as different templates to display the same data output in different ways. And so what this means is that if we want to have a desktop, um, desktop website and a mobile website, we don't actually have to create two completely separate websites. We could still use the same database. We could use uh, maybe some uh, the, the same application logic, but depending on whether we're outputting to a desktop browser or a mobile web browser, then we can just simply make different uh, views. So we could, you could very easily make a mobile theme for your WordPress site that's applied if it detects that the person is viewing it in a mobile web browser. Um, and this is just a, a quick side thing that there are actually plugins that exist that will do that for you. Uh, we'll, we'll detect if your WordPress site is, is being viewed on a mobile web browser and output that as such. I'm going to skip over these next two slides because there's some technologies that were proposed um, for dealing with um, device independent sort of uh, HTML kind of languages, uh, but they haven't really gone anywhere, so it's not much point using them for now. This next slide is uh, CSS media queries, which again I'll kind of skip over because we're going to look at it more in the tutorials. Um, but this is, this is one of the examples of how you can selectively apply CSS to different screen widths. And that's not, it doesn't just work on the mobile context, but can work on uh, the desktop context as well as you resize your browser, it can relay out the page. So if you want to look at any of that stuff, you, you can search for responsive web design and, and those, the articles on responsive web design are a good overview on that whole sort of design philosophy. Um, there's the ability to detect the capabilities of the phone with uh, JavaScript. Um, and again, we'll look at that more uh, in the tutes, but this is just an example of detecting whether the phone supports geolocation um, using JavaScript. And so you can offer one experience if it does and a different one if it doesn't. Modernizer, which we'll also look at, is a, a JavaScript library that essentially is designed for doing that. You can tell it which and it will, will, will spit out the code for you if you tell it which, um, which uh, capabilities you want it to test for. Okay, and I'll go, I'll go very quickly through uh, these next slides just because we're running out of time, but also they're probably more useful if you look at them after the fact anyway. Um, they're mostly just examples. 
So thinking about going from the desktop to the mobile web, uh, essentially you want to be really brutal with what content that you, you actually need to put on the mobile device. So it's tempting to try and port the entire website, but if you're honest with yourself, there's probably certain things that people aren't going to bother doing in a mobile context. So you're going to have some overlap, but then you're going to have some things that are on the desktop website only, and you'll probably have some things that are only on the um, mobile website as well. So this is just an example of uh, a website that I worked on. Um, I don't expect you to be able to read that, but just to show you that this was the, the site map of the desktop website, and after a, a massive color of the features that we didn't think would be useful on the mobile, that's what the, the mobile um, uh, site ended up looking like. Um, okay, so these these next slides are just um, about some of the options you have when you're looking at porting a desktop site to a mobile site. Your first option is to do nothing and just get people to look at your desktop website on the mobile, which is obviously the cheapest option because you don't have to do anything, but it's obviously not going to give you the best user experience. Uh, you have option two, which you could call multi-serve, where the same content is delivered to mobile and desktop, but the CSS and resources like images are tailored to the smaller form factor. And then the best option usually in terms of user experience is to have a mobile-specific version uh, of the uh, website and a desktop-specific version. Okay, just a... Just a quick um, mention about speed. So this is one of the constraints that we, we went over early on, but I'll just go in a little bit more detail. This is just a, a table which shows you the difference between um, your 2G networks and your 3G networks. And just to show you that how much that varies, and you can add to that now the, the 4G networks like LTE, which, um, which is being rolled out in Australia now which actually is faster in a lot of senses than, than some Wi-Fi networks are. So obviously this is going to be more of an issue again if you're targeting the older devices. Um, but essentially, and, and another thing to keep in mind is that cell net networks very rarely operate at their maximum theoretical speed due to things like network load. Um, so all of, those, all of those numbers should be taken as best case scenarios as well. Um, so I'll probably skip over these slides and just let you um, read into them a little later. Um, they're just some more, more information about speed. And then I've just got a couple of um, slides here, which again, I won't really bother going into because uh, we'll go into it more in the tutorials about testing and your various options for testing websites, mobile websites, uh, especially when you can't get... Um, hold of the physical devices themselves. All this will go through in the shoots. And, um, and this I won't even bother going through right now, but the last about 20 slides of this lecture, which you can go through, I'll upload the slides, is just an example of that um, Cypher City's desktop website and, and the design process that we went through to um, go from the desktop version to the mobile version. So I've talked a, a lot um, about sort of the technical constraints and stuff. I haven't talked a lot about the design process that goes before that, but this kind of details that. And you can see, uh, you can see we ended up going for targeting two different classes of device, so the touch screen and the sort of the feature phone before that. And it just lists some of the interfaces um, that we came up with, and some of them are the comparison of the, the desktop and the mobile interfaces as well. Uh, and there's navigation. Okay, and this is just a slide to remind you that it's an iterative process, okay, so you'll probably keep going back and refining your designs. Okay, and last slide, in conclusion, I just want to say that you should always design for the users because they'll provide the context for the application of your theoretical de uh, design principles. And interface development is, is an iterative and ongoing process and it never goes from an idea to resolution in one step.